Donnie Schatz gets 500. Landon Crawley impresses. Kerry Madsen has a newish ride. Details on Dale McDowell's future, plus a bunch of thoughts on the current state of dirt racing streaming. Let's go. It's Tuesday, March 5th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. At Volusia last night, a very nice Daytona Bike Week crowd watched Donnie Schatz pick up career sprint car win number 500. He started fourth and was in the right place at the right time when leader Buddy Kofoid exploded a left rear tire just past halfway. Schatz assumed the lead on the restart and drove on to outlaw win number 312, topping Sheldon Hoddenshield and Carson Macedo. Johnny Gibson said last night that Donnie's 500 career wins started with his first uh, that came in 1993 at the Red River Valley Speedway. So we're talking 31 years of winning sprint car races. Pretty wild to think that Donnie has 312 outlaw wins, plus another 188 across other sanctions and unsanctioned events. With five shows in the books, Donnie's win vaulted him to a tie for second in the current outlaw standings with Geo Selzy. David Gravel remains the championship leader. Last night's podium for Carson Macedo was his first top five and top 10 of the season after a tough dirt car nationals. That team made some changes during the off weeks and looked much more like themselves last night. As for Buddy Kofoid, he shredded that left rear and then got trapped in the work area with no guaranteed time. Now, that happened because it was past halfway. Both he and Jacob Allen were victims of a left rear tire failures on the night. They finished 15th and 16th. Donnie talked in victory lane about how hard they were running through that 25 lap feature and that there was a bunch of wheel spin they were dealing with. He said in those instances, the left rear is the tire that ends up taking the beating and not the right rear like you'd probably think. Uh, it was an interesting insight there from Shots. Hat tip as well to land in Crawley fast again in qualifying and grabbed his first career outlaw top 10. I think he may surprise people all season long as just a 16-year-old driver and driving a car you haven't often seen run up front uh, in Outlaw shows in recent years. The World of Outlaw season continues Friday and Saturday with two nights at Kennedale Speedway Park. The quarter-mile track sits about 20 minutes south of downtown Fort Worth, Texas. In some sprint car news from yesterday, Kerry Madsen will sort of have a new deal for 2024. He closed out last season driving the Vermeer 55. After that car, started with Hunter Schoenberg in the seat and then had Buddy Kofoid for a few races as well. In 22 all-star appearances in the 55, Madsen ended the year with a win, 12 top fives, and 18 top tens. That all-star victory came at Attica, and he also had a weekly win at Knoxville in May driving for Guy Forbrook. But Vermeer hired Chris Windham for 2024 in a full high-limit run, which came along with the NOS Energy Drink sponsorship. For this season, though, Vermeer and Madsen are partnering up to start a new joint sprint car venture to run Knoxville and the Midwest. Madsen told Jeremy Elliott at SprintCarUnlimited.com they are starting from scratch putting this team together and that they hope to run 40 or 50 shows through the year, including weekly at Knoxville and Hussets, plus nearby Ward of Outlaws and High Limit races. Madsen again spent the offseason down, uh, down under doing some racing in Australia with Cricky Motorsport included a seventh place run in the grand annual sprint car classic. There's still plenty of time though, to get the team together. Uh, racing at Knoxville doesn't start until April 20th and uh, Hussett's opener isn't until May 12th. I also wanted to double back to some late model news from a few days ago. I felt like this one got buried a little bit. Actually, I didn't even notice it until uh, yesterday. During Speed Week's Flow Racing's Kyle McFadden had a story about veteran racer Dale McDowell possibly looking at his career coming to an end. Back then, he said, quote, it could be one of our last years. We're having some sponsors move around at the end of this year. So if we have some partners to come in to create some opportunities, then we can uh, race in 2025, unquote. Last week, thanks to a post from MSR Mafia that was also shared on the Shane McDowell Facebook page, uh, Shane McDowell Racing Facebook page, it was revealed that the team is losing longtime sponsor EasyGo. The partnership began in 2015, but will end after the 2024 season. We know now that the Shane McDowell Racing 17M will continue in 2025 with Dale still behind the wheel. The big question, though, is the schedule. In the absence of a new primary sponsor or other associates stepping up, the team will scale back on the number of races they can test. In 2023, the 57-year-old McDowell appeared at 42 races. He won 10 times across XR, the Spring and Southern Nationals, the Hunt the Front Series, and he also had that big $50,000 score at the topless 100. So far this season, McDowell has 10 starts. Uh, those came at Volusia and Golden Eyes. He's got a best finish of seventh that happened during the Sunshine Nationals with the World of Outlaws. The team is planning a similar schedule this season as to what they did last year. But what a less aggressive schedule would look like, we don't know yet. We know there are certainly plenty of races uh, that happen near their Tennessee-based race shop.
Finally today, I've been asked a few times about some of the recent streaming stru uh, stuff across the sport, so I thought we could dive in just a bit today. I mentioned on the Sunday Daily Show that Flow Racing would again only be streaming a certain races this year from Lincoln Speedway and not their full schedule. That will be similar to what we saw there in 2023. And if I remember correctly, that was a track decision to scale back on the number of shows that would be on Flow. We also know that Bridgeport isn't back on the schedule for Flow Racing this season. The track shared to social media in recent days that Flow had decided to opt out of their contract with the New Jersey Dirt Track for the 2024 season, and that Dirt Track Digest will be taking over their streaming. This shouldn't be all that surprising, as we've seen Flow Racing pare down their offerings over the last year or two. I've said this before, but we're several years now into this new world order of uh, dirt racing streaming and monthly subscriptions, and these services have very good data now on what actually sells subscriptions and what races people are tuning in to watch. There's no reason to continue paying rights fees for tracks and series that don't move the needle. I've been asked as well about the Comp Cams Super Dirt Series, which is a regional dirt lay model series that runs around the South. They race this week at Boot Hill Speedway, but neither show uh, Friday or Saturday is listed on the flow schedule. I've been told we will likely see them end up on another streaming service here very soon. I do think you'll continue to see some consolidation on these deals over the next year or couple of years. Where they have options on lower performing content, uh, Flow Racing will get out. And then some of the longer term deals will start to expire and not get renewed. None of this should be surprising or unexpected as Flow uh, you know, worked to gain a foothold in dirt racing early. So they grabbed up a bunch of stuff and now they're just going to focus on uh, what really works for them. Certain events and series and tracks, they're going to want higher rights fees in the next round of contract negotiations with the streaming services as well. But if they don't have the big numbers, it's going to be very hard for them to have leverage for those new deals. In the aftermath, I think you're going to see tracks and series look to other options for that revenue, including the existing niche providers, or they're going to try to make a go of it alone. The Southern All-Stars late models went that path with their recently announced SAS Dirt.TV. Certainly an option that can be viable, but then you take on all of the risk with promotion and production costs. I think some will make that path work and others are going to fail. Regardless of whether it feels like things have solidified in streaming, this is still very fluid, uh, this space, uh, and it's going to continue to shift and change in the coming years. Low Sports as a whole continues to try and find a path towards sustainable profitability, kind of moving out of that startup mode. While Dervision will continue to be a centerpiece of, uh, of World Racing Group, and, and they're going to try to make smart content moves outside of that WRG sphere where they can. All right, that's it for today's Daily Show. Hope you guys have a great Tuesday out there. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.